Good afternoon. Um, thank you to the organisers for the, uh, the invitation. Thank you in particular to the ADFA staff, who I uh, gave the uh, unfortunate task this morning of printing off 80 copies of my late delivered paper. Uh, so I much appreciate all that work that's gone on behind the scenes. Uh, and you should have a, um, a copy in front of you. Uh, I've titled my uh, presentation on Australia, A Cautiously Calibrated Approach, which gives you, I think, probably a, a decent idea of where I'm going to go with this. Um, I'm doubly thankful to be here as a, uh, a non-Australian, if I can admit that up front, I'm asked to talk about Australia in the South China Sea. It's a, it's a symbol of Australia's openness to debate on one level, on another level, it makes me think that maybe there were some Australians who didn't want to be in this role and that I ended up drawing the short straw instead. Anyway, I'll have a go. Um, my focus is quite uh, narrowly on freedom of navigation, not because I think it should be at the centre of the uh, South China Sea debate, but just in frank um, uh, recognition that that's how it's been in the last year. And just, just to sort of bear that out, when I'm asked questions by the media, more often than not, it's always on the same question, when will Australia... Uh, do a freedom of navigation operation, or why has Australia not done? So that's the context. However vocally supportive Canberra is of the United States in the South China Sea, in an operational sense, I think it has held back since Washington began its uh, freedom of navigation operations last October, uh, shortly after Ma Malcolm Turnbull took over Prime, uh, Prime Minister. That's the question I want to get to. Why is that so? Uh, the delay, I think, is long enough to discount simple hesitancy or domestic political distraction, although there's been no shortage of that with a general election and, uh, and, and more besides. I think it points more plausibly um, to a policy decision. I don't know that, but I'm just uh, I'm guessing. Not to launch any Australian freedom of navigation patrol or overflight under the current admin US administration, uh, at least. The contrast between Australia's forward declaratory position on the South China Sea in terms of foreign ministry and prime ministerial statements and its operational conservatism on the other is sharpened when compared with the ongoing Australian Defence Force commitments in the Middle East, where with little parliamentary debate or public controversy, the government maintains there is a strategic need to commit substantial expeditionary combat forces on an open-ended basis um, to support the US-led air campaign against ISIS over Iraq and Syria. Now, why do I mention the Middle East? Because I think, in contrast, in the South China Sea, in spite of the government's robust de declaratory stance on freedom of navigation and overflight, and a clear articulation of Australians' national interest being at stake in official government documents, and obvious demand signals from the United States in the, re in the last year, not a single ship or aircraft that we know of uh, has been sent to challenge excessive claims of China and other states in the Spratly Islands. According to the 2016 Defence White Paper, Australia is concerned about the militarisation of artificial features in the South China Sea and opposes uh, assertions of territorial claims and maritime rights that are inconsistent with national, international law. Moreover, the ADF is regularly present in the South China Sea in the course of normal operations, providing ample opportunity for a dedicated surface FONOP or overflight. So such caution about conducting non-combat operations, again, the contrast with what's being done in the Middle East and a non-combat, combat, essentially legal operation in the South China Sea, albeit with operational risk, and I'll get to that later, um, could be seen as inconsistent with Canberra's official articulation of mar maritime security interests. And I think it also jars with Australia's willingness to commit military force to a US-led coalition uh, in a region, while important in terms of the counter-terrorist struggle, uh, is less obviously central to, to Australia's security interests than Southeast Asia or its surrounding waters. Australia's reluctance to undertake FONOPs in the South China Sea begs the wider question whether Canberra has in fact grown averse to military deployments in its own region that might incur a negative reaction from China. At the very least, the government's uh, circumspection and its lack of public articulation on the matter has left uh, it open to this perception. Now, I'll, having framed that, I think, um, as provocatively as I, as I could have done, um, I'll walk back a little bit here because I think in context... Um, 
if we look at the, the conduct of the United States and its um, freedom of navigation operations, uh, there is, I think, an uncertain lead over the last year. It should be noted that Washington has behaved much more cautiously than many observers expected. The US Navy itself has been surprisingly sparing in its own efforts to challenge excessive claims in the South China Sea, carrying out just three uh, surface freedom of navigation um, um, transits uh, in the last year, two in the Spratly Islands, one in the Paracels. That's significantly less than the twice quarterly frequency that was widely mooted at the, uh, at the outset. Uh, and the US position with regard to military overflight is somewhat murky, um, although um, there has been no deliberate mission that's been officially acknowledged. Most surprising of all, and this was already flagged in Zach Cooper's presentation, the three surface freedom of navigation operations have all been conducted as so-called um, uh, innocent passage in a very non-provocative, low-key, about as low-key as one could get within the rubric of a, of a freedom of navigation um, framework. If Washington has formally requested Canberra, uh, and we don't know again if that has happened, uh, to join in South, South, South China Sea uh, FONOPS, that's not been made public. But numerous official um, uh, and unofficial statements by visiting uh, American officials, including senior military, um, uh, has left little, little room for doubt uh, in, about US preferences for Australia to be more operationally supportive in the South China Sea. And likewise, Beijing has, has uh, left Australia in little doubt about Chinese hostility to what it sees as unwelcome outside interference. So this increasingly makes Canberra appear to be precariously balanced on the horns of a strategic dilemma uh, between Washington and Beijing in the South China Sea. Now, again, I'll step back a little bit before talking about Australia's interests in the South China Sea, because in the wider context, the, the South China Sea has also played I think a, a catalytic uh, role in a fast evolving China debate here in, in recent weeks. Uh, in just that quarter since July, Australia's China debate has intensified as three apparently separate developments came in three in quick succession. There could be more, but I'll just isolate three. One, the Hague ruling uh, on the Philippines, uh, China's reaction against Australia's strong statement of support. Then um, the following month, there was a, a sale of a, a major utility, uh, Ausgrid, which was um, rejected on national security grounds. Uh, and then there was, at the political level, the Sam Dastiari, Sam Dastiari influence um, peddling affair, which I won't um, elaborate on the details of. Australians will all be familiar with. Um, but there was an issue of, uh, of underhand payments that were made to a, uh, a senator on the front bench of the opposition. The alignment of these three events has triggered a wider and still evolving debate about the extent of Chinese state influence in Australia, but also about how economically close uh, and politically close <coughs> Australia should get. As a result of economic and security de uh, debates on China have actually broken out of their traditional silos, uh, and I can attest to this to the mutual bewilderment of pundits from both sides because they don't speak the same language. And a more mature national debate, which I think may be in the offing now, would certainly benefit from a common language around risk management. This is not the venue to develop that wider story, but I think uh, it is necessary to put um, where the South China Sea plays that role in a wider debate. It should not be the only um, issue in the China relationship or even necessarily the defining one, uh, but it certainly played an important catalytic role in shaping that debate. So on to Australia's interests, which are unsurprisingly both economic and military, direct and indirect. First of all, there's the South China Sea's economic importance to Australia as a conduit for mer merchant traffic, uh, accounting according to uh, the white paper again, for nearly two thirds of the country's exports. Uh, and this is used to connote a strategic significance. Now, Critics of that um, often repeated statistics say that actually a lot of the exports, particularly to Japan and Korea, will pass east of the Philippines normally. Um, so that's one point that sort of detracts from that, that uh, obvious um, read across from economic importance to strategic importance. Uh, there's the question of diversion from the South China Sea too, that uh, under, um, if there was an impedance to traffic, that uh, alternate, alternative routes could be used. Uh, and that proposition itself is rejected by many critics who say, how could there be 
uh, a logical um, uh, desire on one of the coastal countries to actually interrupt the trade, particularly as um, China receives $107 billion of Australia's seaborne trade, which is more than both Japan and Korea uh, combined. These criticisms, I think, um, are valuable in that they, they do highlight that a strategic, the, the strategic value of a body of water uh, does not automatically correlate to the economic value of seaborne trade that transits through there under normal conditions. Um, but I think also it misses the, the more fundamental point that if there were to be uh, conflict in the South China Sea for other reasons, that would certainly have a direct and indirect impact on Australia's security, which would play out economically uh, and otherwise. Second, militarily, Australia has direct military interests in terms of access for its Navy and Air Force to the South China Sea. These should not be exaggerated for a modest sized force like the ADF, but nonetheless, Australia's interactions within the five power defense arrangements have for decades in, entailed large scale uh, array, uh, exercises in the South China Sea uh, with Southeast Asian partners, uh, as well as Operation Gateway, uh, which has been um, mounted by the, uh, the RAAF uh, from Peninsula in Malaysia since 1980, involving surveillance over flights of the Eastern Indian Ocean, but also the South China Sea. Uh, Southeast Asia is identified as a key area for defense engagement in the, in the white paper. Uh, and to take one example, a budding relationship with a country like Vietnam is very difficult to imagine if there were serious restrictions on access to the, uh, the South China Sea. It physically would be compromised. Uh, and as I argued in, a, in an opinion editorial last year, creeping restrictions would affect all littoral states in the South China Sea, including the ability of the ADF to operate mu across much of Southeast Asia. So it's not simply an abstract concern in that sense. Third, and not least, there is the US alliance to consider, both at a, a direct and indirect level. And as the US, as we've been hearing, turns its attention to this region, uh, Australia's strategic heft and its knowledge will count primarily uh, in regional terms, especially Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, and our Western uh, uh, maritime approaches. This arguably uh, represents a return to what I'd call strategic normalcy, as defined by the early decades of the, uh, the ANZUS rela um, relationship uh, and geographically embodied in the Radford-Collins agreement. Uh, but that analogy would be to understate, I think, the scale uh, and the complexity of China's strategic challenge and its potential to overturn not just the US-backed order, but all that that implies for the foundation of Australia's foreign and defense policy. So back to the, uh, the contemporary policy environment. I believe the, the Turnbull administration appears to have settled on a twofold diplomatic approach to the South China Sea, based on even-handedness towards the territorial disputes, often framed as not taking sides and urging restraint on all, on all parties. But this is juxtaposed against robust statements supporting freedom of navigation, such as Australia will continue to exercise our international law um, rights to freedom of navigation and overflight and support the right of others to do so, quoting from Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. Uh, Ms. Bishop's statement in support of the Hague Award uh, was one of the relatively few internationally that actually uh, flagged the binding status of that on both parties, uh, and that met with a fairly stinging rebuke from, uh, from China uh, officially. Uh, at the multilateral level, Australia has also been active in terms of raising maritime security in the South China Sea uh, at all um, events that it has a seat at the table of, uh, from the ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, to the East Asia Summit. Um, it was unfortunate there wasn't a defence minister present at this year's Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, but there was an election on at least as a, um, a plausible reason for that absence. In the absence of any definitive government statement clarifying the extent of the ADF's uh, activities in the South China Sea, it does seem safe to assume that Australia has not conducted either surface transits or military overflights within 12 nautical miles of the disputed, uh, disputed features in the South China Sea. Uh, this is an assumption that's also been echoed, interestingly, by the opposition uh, here in this country, where um, uh, the former defence spokesman who's now stood down, Stephen Conroy, uh, was out uh, to, the, to the right, if you like, uh, of the ruling coalition in advocating a, a, an Australian navigation patrol uh, in the lead-up to the election, uh, although since then the, the opposition has become a bit more muted on that. 
there are indications that what I call Australia's cautiously calibrated approach is actually creating some frictions within the alliance, um, as suggested by uh, uh, visiting officers who have made no secret of their um, uh, preference for Australia to be more um, forthcoming in it, operationally, um, and uh, even in terms of Australia uh, most recently uh, encouraged to make a choice, um, uh, which would be music to Hugh White's ears um, to hear that particular formulation. It is more common, I think, though, to hear US commentators voicing concerns that Australia is, is showing uh, excessive deference to China uh, and opening itself to uh, pressure tactics accordingly. Whatever the motivations for Canberra's uh, current caution in the South China Sea, however, it would be unfair to blame Australia uh, solely for this foot dragging, given the Obama administration's somewhat diffident lead. Um, furthermore, I think we're at a, we are at a foreign policy threshold not simply in terms of the election cycle of the United States, but maybe a fundamental redefinition of US politics writ large. And in that context, I think it would be a brave Australian leader who was to step up to uh, the leadership plate, uh, at least um, for the next few months. High profile of, um, Australian advocates of freedom of navigation's operations, and Kim Be Beasley is one, Gareth Evans is another, have expressed a preference for freedom of navigation with Australian characteristics. Uh, a solo freedom, phonop, freedom phonop foray into the Spratleys is still possible, um, but the other point I would change is that time has not stood still. The operational environment becomes progressively more, more difficult and the risks mount. Um, awareness of this, I believe, may have already reinforced Canberra's caution uh, and also likewise the preference of the United States uh, to do so in concert, um, partly as a way of... of uh, 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 sending a signal of, of, of um, uh, alliance cohesion, but also um, simply a way of minimizing the risk on what may have been possible two years or three years ago, but no longer is to the same extent. Uh, one other point I think that may be at, uh, in play here, uh, we focus on freedom of navigation, but it's not only the South China Sea where those uh, claim, where those concerns are relevant in Southeast Asia. Canberra has his historically focused more on access through the Indonesian archipelago as its main concern, uh, and has clashed with Jakarta over naval access rights along an east-west axis through, the in through Indonesian waters where there is no archipelagic sea lane. Awareness of this dormant sensitivity could be playing into a risk-averse approach uh, on freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And I think this equally applies to the air domain, given that Indonesia is now openly discussing uh, declaring its own ADIZ. Malaysia, too, which we've heard about earlier today, uh, is Canberra's FPDA partner, but also applies restrictions on military activities within its own exclusive economic zone that are not consistent with international law, at least Australia's interpretation of it. So I think there may be a fear of, of, uh, of a knock-on in, in, um, in that light. And finally, I'll just quote a little bit from um, Australia's Chief of Air Force, who recently gave a, a, a media interview, um, saying that on the one hand, there is much less clutter in the air than there is at the surface level, and that it's a much lower risk, um, a lower threat, lower risk environment. Um, but I was taken by his comments too there that uh, there are claims within that area that have nothing to do with Australia, which to my mind seems more of a, a political distancing comment uh, rather than just a comment on the operational environment. So in sum, the first question is, um, for how long can Australia maintain its current calibrated approach in the South China Sea? I think the answer to that depends to a large extent on the course of US-China relations in the year to come. Once the strategic weather gods in Beijing uh, and in, uh, in Washington become clearer, uh, and for that matter, um, even in the Philippines, a great deal of regional uncertainty about where the post-award strategy of the country which originally brought the, brought the case uh, means that I think there is a, uh, certainly a, a high level of, of caution. And in that sense, listening to all of the presentations today, in some senses, Australia really isn't, really isn't that different uh, in the uh, dilemma that we face. But even, as, even if a decision in Canberra uh, is made to accept greater costs and risks uh, in resisting China's advances in the South China Sea, the question now has to be asked, um, is Beijing's consolidation of control now effectively a fait accompli? Uh, can it be reversed? Uh, 
Uh, and is the, if, we, if, it, if it is to be reversed, then I think maybe the window for effective freedom of navigation operations uh, is fast closing. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.